Well, thank you very much. He exaggerated my ability to speak Spanish, so I apologize for being afraid to give this talk in Spanish. Uh, over beers, I will talk Spanish, but not, not scientifically. So actually, I have two talks which I cannot finish here, so I'll spend most of my time on ice sheet modeling, but uh, there's probably more people here interested in the second part. And I'll, that second part, I'll just give some examples of our, our uh, meshing technique for, for climate applications. Um, uh, so, first I'm modeling on ice sheets. Uh, for us, ice sheets is, uh, what I mean by ice sheets is land ice, glaciers, and especially Greenland and Antarctica. So it's not land in the Arctic or sea ice. There's a difference between sea ice and land ice. So this is land ice. So we've been doing this for quite a while. Uh, so let me just tell you, uh, uh, so let's see what's the distribution of water on the Earth. So you see this, most of it is salt water. And I'll just give you some figures here. So salt water is 97.5% of the world water. 2.5 is fresh water. And 1.75%, so most of that is in uh, ice caps, glaciers, and uh, permanent snow. The most of this, of this 2.5%, 70% is in Antarctica, the ice in Antarctica and Greenland. Groundwater, the rest is in subsurface water, below surface. Surface water is very little. Rivers have almost nothing. Lakes have almost nothing. The atmosphere has almost nothing. And all flora and fauna, we're all made of water, Together, we have even less than nothing, practically nothing. So what happens if Greenland and Antarctica, the, all the ice disappears? If all the ice disappears from Greenland, sea levels will rise by seven meters. And it's happened. Over geological time, Greenland has, over many, many, many centuries in, over geological time, Greenland has had no ice, and sea level rise that. Antarctica, if all, if all of Antarctica meant 61 meters sea level rise. Now, I live in Florida, which is very flat. So this is the view from the highest mountain in Florida, 105 meters. And if you go down the peninsula, this is right near the top of Florida. If you, if you go to the, to the peninsular part of, of Florida, the highest point is 95 meters. And this is a view up to the top of that mountain. So it's very flat. So of course, I live in Florida. Uh, I'm concerned. In fact, Florida is the answer to the trivia question, what state in the United States has the lowest, highest point? It's Florida. And by the way, over geological times, Florida has been underwater more than it's been above water. So, it's so here's what happens if you have a five meter uh, sea level rise to southern Florida. And this is all of Florida. Now this is what happens near where I live. I happen to live right about here. So if we get a 60 meter inundation, I have beachfront property. So it's good. And just to show you a little bit of the Gulf and, and, and the Yucatan and that, this is what a 6 meter rise would uh, all of the red part would be underwater. Okay, so you remember in two, the, every seven years there's this panel that puts out a report about the state of the art of climate modeling. And every report that's ever been put out, including the last one, says probably the weakest link in climate modeling is ice sheets. There's the science of ice sheets, which is important to know because you want to know how fast things are melting, is not good enough. So there's been a lot of activity in ice sheets, but compared to how there used to be, but very little activity compared to what there is for atmosphere, or for ocean, or for even sea ice. So I'm going to tell you the basics of ice sheet modeling. What is, how, do, how, do, how are ice sheets modeled? So we have a three-dimensional coordinate system, Z the vertical coordinate. Uh, there's a bottom topography, 
which is in Greenland, not Antarctica, and usually is, is rock. Uh, so we, that's known, the bottom topography, and there's an elevation of the ice. And so the difference between the height and the bottom topography is ice thickness. So one of our variables will be the ice thickness. And so ice sheets are modeled as a very slowly moving, incompressible flow of a viscous fluid. I don't know if you have ever seen time-lapse photograph of a glacier, you'll appreciate that the ice moves. It just moves very, very slowly. So, it's mo so, so in principle, you can model it by the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, but since it moves so slowly, we, inertial terms are neglected, so that the gold standard of ice sheet modeling is the Stokes equations, steady state, because uh, even, even the, the very... The, the time scales for the variations in the dynamics of the ice are much, much longer than the variations for the temperature and for other, other variables in the, in the ice. So it's modeled as a steady Stokes equation. Now, this was good for me because I'm, I'm, I'm a phi element person, and I spent a lot of time on the Navier -Stokes, phi element methods for Navier Stokes equations and Stokes equations. So I said, well, yeah, this is this problem in rheology. The viscosity is nonlinearly dependent on the gradient of the velocity and also the temperature, so it's not so simple. And, uh, and then the momentum equation, which is this nonlinear Stokes equation, is coupled to, to an evolution equation for the temperature. There you do have time dependence because the scales are much faster. And an evolution equation of the ice sheet, of the, of the height, which is also changes much faster than the ice moves in the horizontal. So that's a gold model. However, no one uses that model until now in, in climate system models. The, no one uses. So there are simplified models. And the simplification is because it's due to the fact that the, even though ice thickness can be several kilometers thick in, in Greenland and Antarctica, the horizontal, the horizontal extent of the ice sheets like Greenland and Antarctica are thousands of kilometers. So, if you, so you have a small parameter, the vertical extent divided by the horizontal extent. And as you all know, once you have a small parameter, you can start figuring out what terms you can throw out and simplify your model. So the Stokes is fully 3D. So we have this parameter delta. And then there's a, just like airlines have a hierarchy of frequent flyer programs, we have a hierarchy of models here. It's actually more like a tree, as you'll see. So there are a couple of models that you keep all, you keep the order delta terms so that your error is order delta squared. So the first order, so-called first order model, that's why it's called the first order model, even though it's second order accurate, uh, is also a 3D model, but it has, but the pressure uh, uncouples uh, the, from the, in the Stokes equations, uncouples from the velocity, so you can solve for the velocity separately, and you can solve for the horizontal velocity separately. I'll go through quickly, and there's another model. Velocity separately, and you can solve for the horizontal velocity separately. I'll go through quickly, and there's another model. And there's a shallow ice model, which is equivalent to sort of like the same kind of uh, dimensional analysis you do to get from, from Navier-Stokes to shallow water, or from Euler to shallow water. Uh, you use here, you get the so-called shallow ice model. And there's a different model sh that holds for shelves. So in other words, where, where, the, uh, where the ice interacts with the ocean. So there's a hierarchy of models. So what is a Stokes model? Well, there is a Stokes equation, the gradient of the stress plus the, uh, sorry, the divergence of the stress plus the gradient of the pressure is equal to the gravitational force, and you get incompressibility. The stress is proportional to strain, but this viscosity coefficient, this viscosity coefficient here, where are you, is heavily dependent on the, the, on the strain. This is the, the, uh, point, the uh, element-wise product of, of the strain tensor. And this coefficient here depends on the temperature. So that's the model that everybody would like says we should be using, but nobody uses until re more recently. And the energy equation is standard, uh, except, again, we have, the, we have the joule heating due to deformation. We have this nonlinear viscosity here. And the thickness is, again, standard. It's a hyperbolic 
conservation law. Uh, and then we have a source term because snow comes down or things melt. So that's the model. We need initial conditions. So the, the temperature and the height needs initial conditions. The velocity doesn't because it's a, a quasi-static model. And that's one of the big problems, weaknesses of ice sheet modeling. Because no one knows what the initial temperature is inside the ice. People can measure surface temperature very accurately from satellite data. Then they can drill holes. All of Greenland, I think they've only drilled like 50 holes and pull out the ice and measure the temperature, and that's it. So people have to make guesses of what the temperature is at the bottom, and then they interpolate between the top and bottom, or now they're using data simulation techniques to find the temperature, but this is a big weakness. And then we have ocean atmosphere boundary conditions. Those are standard. And the other big weakness is the ocean, is the, uh, well, now ocean ice is also standard, the continuity of the stress, basically. What's not standard, and again, is the second big weakness, modeling weakness. So I want to emphasize that the weaknesses are not just computational, and not just what is the model, but what, what, what is the model equations, but it's also what are the boundary conditions is the biggest weakness. So there you have no, we have no penetration boundary condition, and then you have a slip boundary condition, because the ice in some places, the ice is fixed to the, bo the bottom. Then you have that the, the tangential velocity is zero in some places. But in other places, the ice slides. And this is very important because when the ice slides, it creates friction. And create frictions, you actually melt the water at the bottom of the ice, which creates underground lakes, which makes it slide even faster and accelerates ice going into the, into the ocean. So this is, I'm not going to go into details, but this is a tangential stress. It's proportional to the tangential velocity, but this proportionality con you know, factor, nobody really knows what it is, and this is one of the things we do research on, trying to figure out what that is. Then there's also the temperature, again, as I told you already, no one knows what it is. And the height, the initial condition, people know, that's well known, so those aren't problems. So the big problems are the so-called basal boundary condition at the bottom and the temperature initial condition as far as modeling. So the first order model gets rid of some terms because by assuming that the horizontal derivatives of the vertical vo vis uh, velocity are negligible. And that leads to a simplified model. So instead of the Stokes model, first you realize there's only one, there's only, tau only involves the velocity, the stress, so this only involves the horizontal components of the velocity. These, these elements of the stress only involve the horizontal component of the velocity, but it's still a 3D model. But this is just a nonlinear elliptic system. So it's much easier to solve than the Navier-Stokes equation, which has a, so the divergence constraint has disappeared. And if, if the divergence, if you want to know the horizontal, the vertical velocity, you integrate at each point in x and y, the div u equals zero, and likewise for the pressure, you can integrate at each z. At each x, y, you can integrate in z to find the pressure. So this is a, this is a much a simpler model, even though it's still nonlinear, because it only involves, it uncouples the velocity, the horizontal velocity from the vertical velocity and the pressure, and, uh, and it involves a simpler equation to deal with. So that's what this slide says. The shallow self model is another, uh, another simplification. You do some additional simplifications, and now the model becomes a 2D model, becomes a two-dimensional model. It's only x and y, and again, it's an ellipt this is now again an elliptic equation in x and y, so it's much easier. And the shallow ice model is even easier, because you can actually get uh, exact you can actually integrate it exactly, well, not exactly, but in terms of an integral. So it's simple. Uh, the details aren't important. I just want to tell you that there's a hierarchy of models. Now, almost all climate system models in the world use a shallow ice model to do ice sheets. They don't use the first order model, and they don't use the Stokes model. Almost all of them use a shallow ice model, and uh, some of them even simpler than that. But that's sort of the state of the art until very recently in ice sheet modeling. There's another model that I won't go into, which is 
has the same accuracy as the, uh, as the first order model, but, uh, and is, is now also being used. By the way, I should have mentioned that I work with the people at, uh, in the Department of Energy has, uh, is developing a new climate system model under the acronym ACME, which they're changing because C stands for climate, and that's not a good word to use in Washington these days. So they're changing that acronym. And part of that, part of that ACME is a, a thing that's been developed by Los Alamos and, and, and NCAR called MPAS, Model Prediction Across Scales. So they're developing ocean, they different components based on variable resolution meshes. And, uh, and so our, uh, our, our technology for Stokes and First Order is part of this MPAS system for the land ice is one of the things. And also our gridding technology is part of MPAS for ocean, for ocean as well as land ice. So anyway, this is a, it's, not, it's really a tree. It's really a tree. You start with Stokes, you simplify to First Order, and then you derive these. This one is the same, as, uh, same accuracy. It's a little simpler than First Order, but has the same accuracy. And that's our, that's our hard models. So our, comp our computational method methodology is basically uh, the current state of the art, I say, is mostly shallow ice model. It's, it's, most of these climate system models use quasi-uniform grids and uh, rectangular grids usually and use lower to finite difference or finite volume schemes, and they approximate boundaries by staircases. You know, they don't have... So what we worked on is variable resolution conforming, boundary conforming meshes, high order phi element methods, and parallel solvers. So our grids, so our grids like in, in a lot of climate modeling, are 2D grids and then layered in the third dimension. So we first produce a, 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 a 2D grid, and then uh, drop layers down. So in our phi element code, we use, uh, we use uh, prismatic elements where the, the surface grid is triangular, but then we drop down prisms, which we divide into tetrahedra. So, and then use phi element methods for that. So we can do, and our grid refinement right now is, is, is based on passive information. For instance, we can do it based on the surface temperature, or the height, or whatever information you have, uh, we're moving towards doing adaptive uh, uh, grid generation. Uh, but we know where we have to, we have to, uh, we have to do our gridding. And our, so here's a here's a grid uh, using our technology that you can see. This is this is I don't know how many thousands of grid points, but here's a here's a blow up uh, for this region right here. So you see we have a very boundary conforming grid. So, so we refine the grid so that we conform to the boundary and also so that uh, where it's needed. And conforming to the boundary uh -huh, is important because most of the interesting activity is here. Most of the, most of the, most of the melting occurs through, most of the uh, water that's lost from ice sheets is done through ice rivers on the surface that then flow into the ocean. And those ice rivers occur in the shallower parts of the ice sheet. So you have to resolve the boundary anyway to, to get those ice rivers well. So here we, we have boundary resolution down to one kilometer. And, uh, and we want to do even better than that. And in the middle we have like where nothing much is happening, we can do 20, 30, 40 kilometer. So here's our typical 2D grid. And this is a blow up that we have a 3D this is, this is the bottom topography, you see, and we have layers there. Uh, so discretization is, again, phi element methods. For those of you who know anything about phi elements, it's a Taylor Hood phi elements. And we want to do conservation, so we actually change the discretization because that particular choice of phi elements does a bad job of, of mass conservation. And you get these anomalies, for example, uh, this, is, this is supposed to be the divergence of U, but there are anomalies you, basically where you switch from a sliding condition to a fixed uh, no-slip condition. You get these anomalies in the, uh, in, in the divergence of U, but by making an amendment to Taylor Hood, we can get very good mass conservation, 10 to the minus 6 over many years. Uh, that's for, the, for Stokes. For the first order, remember those are elliptic equations, we just use quadratic phi elements. So we get, 
we got third order accuracy here where most climate system models use basically something that use first order discretizations and we get third order. Anyway, we've done all this. Uh, so we have to solve the nonlinear equations. So uh, usually people use a, a simple Picard iteration, a fixed point iteration. And we've implemented Newton and quasi-Newton methods for doing this. Uh, so these are relatively, these are well-known methods, so these is basically low-hanging fruit to greatly speed up the iterations over what's been done now. Uh, we do start with Picard because it's more robust as far as what initial, what's the initial, what's the initial guess for, for your iterative methods. So we start with Picard so that we get a, a, a good guess for Newton. And this is the kind of speed-ups we get in uh, uh, using our hybrid method and, and just a simple fixed point iteration in, in converging the number of iterations you need to converge the, uh, the nonlinear discrete equations, the solution of the nonlinear discrete equations. Uh, again, and this is for Stokes, same kind of thing for four different benchmark problems. So you see, we start with a few Picard iterations, but then switch to Newton and get a very fast convergence. Uh, for linear solvers, we, uh, we do a grid partitioning, uh, which is very easy to do with our grid technology, to, to get a grid partitioning such that the load is balanced between when we assign to processors. We use the Metis grid partitioning algorithms. We use, for those of you who are interested, we use the Trilinos uh, package with uh, Boomer MG uh, algebraic multigrid preconditioner. So here's for a, for a square, this is the partitioning you get, and the number of nodes there uh, is, are load balanced. And here, we, how we do for Greenland. So these are just for a few, if you just have a few processes, this is what we would get. And there's a lot of activity here, so there's very fi this is all fine grid, so that's why this is a small region, because this is all fine grid, likewise here. And we do both non-overlapping non and overlapping domain decomposition in, in, in doing our parallel solvers. And this is our, uh, our uh, for five kilometer uh, and two kilometer, so that's, this is the minimum resolution, this is variable resolution, this is the minimum resolution anywhere in Greenland with either 1.5 degrees of freedom or 9.5 million degrees of freedom. This is the speed ups we get, uh, we sort of get pretty close to linear speed up a little with 10 to the fourth processors, and then there seems to be, uh, well, there seems to be some saturated, here communications start taking over, and you get killed with the computers we were using in those days. So we verified our technology by developing, and by, this, is, this was also a new thing. We, so when people use manufactured solutions to verify that a, that your code is getting the accuracy you expect, et cetera, et cetera. It's very important when you, when you manufacture a solution that it has the features of the problem you're trying to solve. So you don't want to use a very smooth solution, manufactured solution, because, yeah, your code will work great. But then if you're, the thing you're actually trying to solve doesn't have a smooth solution, what you did is it doesn't give you really any information. So we manufactured a solution which uh, has really has almost all the features of the solutions we want, except it's not divergence free. Uh, well, no, it is divergence free, except uh, yeah, except it, it doesn't satisfy quite the equations exactly. We the the right hand side of the momentum equation is a little different, but it does have all the important features, and we see that we get the third order. We get uh, for the Stokes model. Uh, we get third order accuracy and it starts deteriorating. Uh, and for the pressure, we get second order accuracy. It starts deteriorating uh, for reasons we don't understand, but there's 25 million unknown, so probably we didn't converge it. We didn't converge the solution all the way down, is probably why it starts deteriorating. So, a very small sample of the computational results. Uh, so we have done extensive testing on, on, uh, on all the models in the model tree. They've all been programmed in, in Fortran, or in some of them in C++. And they're all part of this, uh, well, 
Uh, some of them are part of this MPAS system. And we have done it, we have done it for, there's a lot of benchmark problems in the literature for square domains. With diff and those benchmark problems, what to do is they vary, for example, what you do at the bottom. You know, the, what kind of boundary condition you put at the bottom, what kind of slope you do to the bottom, and things like that. So we passed all those benchmark tests with flying colors, so we also apply it to realistic geometries. So here is, this is, a, this is the cross-section of a glacier in the, in, uh, somewhere in the Alps. Uh, so this is just a central cross-section of the glacier. And of course, it's not quite that slope. But uh, here it shows you the difference between a no-slip boundary condition down here. So here the ice is fixed all the way in the boundary. This is the same picture I showed you for the divergence uh, equals zero test. So here at the bottom is no slip, and that's what the, and this is the, uh, this is basically the, uh, uh, the magnitude of the, uh, of the velocity going down. And here is the one where uh, this, sec this little section, there's slip. So you see there's a very different uh, solution there. So this is another benchmark test uh, for the ice sheet community. Uh, so here you have, here you show the difference of the first order and the Stokes model solutions. So they're very close. Uh, they're very close. The first orders tend to smooth things out a little bit. But, you know, for many, you know, for many purposes, the first order is good enough. Uh, and here's a combination of different models. And so here's, here's a, uh, For four models with five kilometer uh, minimum resolution with basal slipping allowed. So this is first order. This is shallow ice. This is shallow shelf. And this is L1, L2. Shallow shelf has no hope because it wasn't designed for doing Greenland in the interior. It was designed for doing ice shelves. So there's no hope of that being good. But if you look at these pictures, uh, they're very similar in many respects. Uh, for some reason, I didn't include, I couldn't find my pictures. But everything, but so in the middle, you can use a huge grid. There's a little bit of blue means high velocity of the ice. So there's a little bit in the middle. And first order uh, does, does, they're very similar. On, but there are differences on the boundary. And those differences are important because, like I say, that's where the ice goes into the into the ocean. You see these things like calving of these huge regions the size of some U.S. state going into the water. Those are inconsequential. Well, first of all, they're already floating, so Archimedes told us they're not going to cause any sea, line, sea level rise. But most of the, most of the water, most of the, most of the loss of, in Greenland and Antarctica is due to ice rivers going into the ocean. So, uh, and here's the same thing of Antarctica. So this is what I said before, we're using this, our ice sheet technology as part of that. So what's left to do? There's a huge amount of stuff left to do, unfortunately, because it keeps, it keeps me in business. There are modeling issues that I regularly alluded to. The numerics, especially with respect to efficiency, there's all sorts of uncertainty quantification issues involved. There are inverse problems, like the data simulation problems. There's opportunities for reduced order, reduced rotor modeling. I don't know what that is. Several, and for mathematicians, there's lots of opportunities to do analysis and numerical analysis. So I already touched on, on the basal boundary condition issue. It's very important. Uh, how do you model that proportionality function in the, in the relation between the tangential stress and the tangential velocity? Everybody accepts that there's a, linear, there's a relation between tangential stress and tangential velocity. Nobody really knows what this proportionality function is. And nobody knows, and the other thing, the other thing that I didn't point out there is you, you don't know where you have slip boundary condition and where you have no slip boundary condition. So there's a parameter involved there that tells you if the tangential stress is big enough, you know, just think of pushing something over this carpet. You know, if you just push it very little, it's not going to move. You need to push it quite a lot. So there it's sliding over rock with a lot of weight on top. 
kilometers of ice on top, and yet if the tangential stress is big enough, it's going to start sliding. Uh, and so that's a parameter tau sub c. And again, we don't know what that parameter is, but that, so if the tangential stress is bigger than tau sub c, we put a slip boundary condition. If it's less, we put no slip. But we don't know what tau sub c is. Uh, nobody knows. So again, this is another parameter identification problem, inverse problem that has to be done. I already told you about the initial temperature. Uh, there are sensors on the surface. One of my dreams in doing ice sheet is that I'd get to go to Antarctica, or, or at least Greenland, and walk around in the summer. Uh, but I haven't made that yet. And then an important issue is subglacial hydrology, which is something we are studying. Like I told you, well, there's, there's, there's two ways that you get these underground lakes, in principle. The first way is these so-called moulins. These are crevices. There are crevices that go through the ice. And then if ice melts on the surface, it actually goes down these crevices and goes down to the bottom. And then there's, there's friction between the bedrock and that. It turns out the moulin, so this is subgrid. This is subgrid. So here's some idiots standing next to a moulin. Uh, well, they're not idiots. I assume they know what they're doing, but I wouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so it turns out that moulins don't contribute that much to the water under here, these underground lakes. This is what we call by subglacial hydrology. There's water here. And this is ignored in all climate system models right now. They don't account for the hydrology at all. So, uh, so most of this water here is due to friction, of the, the, the heating due to friction of the ice sliding over the rock, and which accelerates the sliding. So we're modeling, so we're modeling this now uh, by a, a 2D hydrology model down here, water model down here, coupled to the 3D ice sheet. So this, this is still, but there's still work, a lot of work to be done. There's also geothermal sources, I should have mentioned, which contribute to the... That's why you start sliding in the first place, because you have geothermal sources down there that melt the ice. Well, should you worry about sea level rise? Or you, should I worry in Florida? So this is for 19... This, is what hap this was, was put in the 2014 report of the IPCC, which... They, they, the, usually the data for this IPCC reports is frozen at least a year in advance. And then anything you do after that will not get into the report. So this, this is why this, the 2014 report, this is the data from different models. So the best case scenario, so these are the different things. So the worst case scenario is this is feet, or this is meters here in the IPCC report of prediction. So uh, I will not get beachfront property uh, or nowhere close to that. So this is, over, this is over 100 years. Well, up to the year, well, 200 years. No, 100 years to 2100. So you see nothing much has happened, but they think a lot's going to happen in the next 100 years. But the worst case scenario of anybody, any particular, this is the worst case scenario of any particular model. Uh, and this is a variance of, this is a confidence interval, is 1.4 meters. And I have a bunch of references. So I just have a few minutes left, so I don't have time to talk to you about the methodology of our grid generation. It's something that uh, almost, almost mentioned at the beginning, something we call centroidal Voronoi tessellations. Just to tell you what that is, I don't know if you know what a Voronoi tessellation is, but what it is is you, you have, for instance, a region, and you want to divide it into subregions. So you throw down some points, and then you divide it into subregions in which the, all the points in a given subregion are, you throw down point, a point, 10 points, and then you pick one point. Then you find all the points that are closer to that point, and that becomes a subregion corresponding to that point. So then you end up with 10 subregions. So that Voronoi tessellations are ubiquitous in computing now and zillions of applications. Now, now, suppose you've done that. Suppose you have 10 points and you've subdivided into 10 regions. Each region has the points that are closer to one point than to the other nine. 
Now you ask for what's the central mass of these 10 subregions? And you can give some kind of point density function, not physical density. The center of mass of the 10 subregions will have nothing to do with the, so you, the initial 10 points. They're not going to be in the same place. So what we developed is a technology for constructing Voronoi tessellations, again, dividing a region into 10 subregions, let's say. Each one has points containing closer to one of the points but where the point that generated those 10 subregions is also the center of mass. So it coincides. So, and, and it's, not just, it's not just about grids. This, this is about our original work in, 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 in uh, what happened here? Oh, no. Our original work on this was based on uh, image processing. So we did this in color sprays. So you have an image with a million colors and you want to transmit that image. You don't want to transmit, you know, data that each pixel, you need the number of bits to make a million, to, to say one of a million colors. So we only want to use 256 colors. So the question is, which 256 colors would give you the best information? So we do this CVT, this special Voronoi tessellation, in color space, not in the image space. And this is what our original thing was. Anyway, that's centroidal Voronoi tessellations. I'll be glad. Uh, I have a whole talk on this I could have given, but I only have two or three minutes left. So uh, uh, this is the original paper that, uh, that, uh, that almost mentioned. And we've done a lot of work with this and all sorts of, all sorts of applications. So these are the people that have worked on this with, with us on particular climate applications. So I just want to give you some results. So the first one is for regional refined global grids. So again, you're trying to do regional modeling. We, we did some of that a few years ago ourselves, but more than just the grids, but also the discretization. So as far as I know, there's two ways to do regional modeling. Is one, you take a global grid, you do a global calculation, and then you just refine it in the region you want, but you're still doing a global calculation with a refined region. So a single global, global solve, and you have a refined region. The other approach is to do a coarse global simulation and then take data from that global, coarse global simulation and refine and use that data as boundary conditions for just solving in the local region. So we can, our, our technology, I think, is quite good for generating grids for two cases. Now I'm going to show you Voronoi grids because, as I told you, the Los Alamos package for ocean modeling is based, well, I didn't tell you. The, the Los Alamos package for ocean modeling is based on Voronoi grids, hexa basically hexagonal grids. It's a finite volume scheme based on hexagonal grids. And uh, so that's why I'm showing you Voronoi, but we can do the same thing with triangles uh, as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you grids for the first scenario, which is locally refined global meshes. So US is a region of interest that, rec that, rec that la longitude re latitude rectangle. So we have 65,000 total nodes, more than half are, are in the nested region. The outer, the outer domain is going to be quasi-uniform with 120 kilometer resolution. And in the, in the examples I'm showing you, the, uh, uh, the uh, inner region will have a re resolution of 40 kilometers uh, uh, in the interior of the refined region. So what we're going to, what, what, our, what our grids are especially good at is doing transitions from coarse to fine grids, doing that very smoothly. So here is the, the refined region is in orange. That's just a picture. You can barely see it, but uh, you can see, so dark, the darker the orange is, the coarser the grid. So this is a quasi-uniform grid. And then this, uh, this, this grid is transitioning from the size of the, of the global grid to a, to a fine grid in the middle. So there's, you don't need any, so the data you prescribe on this boundary is exactly the global data. There's no interpolations needed or anything like that because that grid is, as I'll show you next, so here is, here is, the, uh, here is the grid in the interior. You see it's very nicely uniform. 
but here's a grid in the transition region going from a, this is a part of the transition region going from coarse to fine, and you see the transition's very smooth. So there's no artificial effects due to reflections from abrupt changes or anything like that. And, and there's no need to interpolate at the, at the boundary of the refined region because uh, it, it, uh, it matches exactly the, the, the global grid, matches exactly the global grid, so you just put the global data on the same thing. For the second scenario, what do we do? Again, uh, we have, this is a global coarse grid, part of it. So we're only going, now we're going to extract part of this grid we're going to extract part of this grid, that part, and that's a partial, we're going to refine this grid. And this is also good for, for regional modeling. Oh, sorry, everything I said on the previous one applies to this one. The other one is a global calculation, so there's no boundary condition transfer. This is the boundary condition transfer. That first one just shows a smooth transition from a global coarse grid to a refined inner grid so that when you do the global calculation, there's no reflections coming, you know, everything is smooth. This is, this is the one I was talking about before, I apologize. So this is a portion of the global grid that is to be refined. And here is a refined grid. Well, now, I, now you see that this is exactly the boundary, this is exactly the global grid here at the edge, and then it refines into the interior smoothly. Uh, so there's, there's no interpolations necessary. And that shows how you go from the global grid so these are the same as we, ha we usually have a layer from the a global grid, and then we refine in the interior. Uh, so those are for global modeling. For ocean modeling, uh, we do the same thing. Uh, we, uh, we do a variable resolution grid based on some passive knowledge, such as surface temperature in the ocean. But we, or, 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 or uh, kinetic energy, surface kinetic energy in the ocean, things like that. So that's how we determine the grid. So this is, uh, this is a picture of the mean, mean kinetic energy of the uh, surface kinetic energy of the ocean. And, and, uh, and this is a few meshes. So this is a mesh that's partitioned for parallel, for parallel processing of the North Atlantic. Uh, this is just the North Atlantic portion, and this is a Voronoi mesh. So we have a boundary conforming mesh, a bar boundary conforming mesh, and then uh, where the kinetic energy is large, we have small Voronoi cells. Uh, so, and of course, we have grids for land ice models. I already discussed that. Uh, again, uh, this, I already discussed these, so I don't have to tell you about them. But, so, uh, thank you. That's what I had to say, and I'll be, I guess we, I have some time this afternoon to talk to people, right, almost? Right. Yeah, so uh, I'll be happy to talk to anyone who wants to be bored some more. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Max, for your great talk. Very interesting. So now we have uh, time for questions. The way it works, I don't know if they give you a translator, but uh, the questions can be made in English yeah. or in Spanish. Okay. And if they are in Spanish, you can, oh. so, someone will translate for okay. you. What happened with the, or if, if no, I can translate for you. Preguntas? Tenemos tiempo para preguntas? No questions. Good. <laughs> Go have coffee. It's, uh, thank you for your presentation. It's a very simple question about time scale for this. Uh, do you use anything or just the temperature? And time scale for what, what for the ice? For, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the... the well, I guess the time scale is is best described by what sort of time step you need to use in the simulation. So we we integrate for a hundred years, uh, but you know the the time step is usually you know the order we'd like to do in the order of days, 
Right now we're doing like a week or something like that, but I think we, we, we can do days. In production codes, they'll be doing days. Yeah. Preguntas? Following that question. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, when you go from the coarse uh, mesh to the fine mesh, uh, do you have to prescribe how fast you go from one from the coarse to the to the uh, to the finer mesh in order not to get reflections or any other artificial uh, uh, numerical problem? So th the way the way we do refinement is by defining what we call a point density function which, for example, in the ocean one is the kinetic energy. So where the kinetic energy is large, the density, that point density function will be large, and, and we refine. Uh, so yes, you know, indirectly, you have to do that, but uh, you have to do that. But the, that point density function doesn't have to be smooth to get these smooth transitions. So you can say, you know, I want it to be this many. So there's a relation between that point density function and how big the local grid will be. And so if you want a local grid, let's say in the interior, of, you know, two kilometers, and the global one is 40 kilometers, let's say, you know, you, you want a translation from 40 to two, you can define a point density function very easily just based on distance from the boundary and things like that that will give you that smooth transition. No, 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 it'll come out, you know, it, the rate of smoothness, it, it, how smooth the transition is, well, it'll be smooth no matter what, the, but, but the, the, the size of the cells will change rapidly if you have a big change in the, in the in, you know, if you go from one kilometer to a, to a thousand kilometers over a small distance, it's going to be a fairly smooth transition, not as smooth as if you go from two kilometers to 50 kilometers, but it'll be smooth. The, you know, but it, it's really the, the transition is determined by the limits, the, the two limits of the grid sizes you want, the biggest and the smallest, and then it's all automatic, and it almost always turns out very smooth. Well, we have been uh, learning to implement the non-structural grids in triangle shapes. Yeah, yeah. And it has been tough for us to make them to be stable numerically. The grids. The grids. Uh, so these are two D grids. Or yeah, two D grids. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, two D grids for coastal simulations. Yeah. And have been very useful now for uh, yeah, yeah. flooding simulations, uh, including land and, yeah. and water. But now these uh, hexagonal grids uh, came. Uh, can you give some thoughts about the advantage of, or maybe application of one and the maybe other? Maybe we could raise this. I'll just draw on the board. Yeah. Uh, the screen. No, so, okay, so everything I said about hexagonal grids and what we can do with hexagonal grids, we can do with triangular grids. And that's because, I'll just draw you a little picture here. Uh, well, I can draw it on this. Oh. Where is the... Nothing. Oh, he has him. So, so this, is, this is a big theory. So this in general, by Voronoi grids, you have like hexagons. So you have hexagons and you have another hexagon. And then you have, these are the points that generated the grid. And in our case, they're also the center of mass, according to some density function. So now, there's a so-called dual grid. So if you connect these, so, you, let's, so a big problem in computational geometry is given a set of points, triangulate those points, right? What is the best way to triangulate those points? And, you, and the best way known to man is the so-called Delaunay triangulation. And those are, those are constructed from a Voronoi grid by connecting the points so that they have to cross the boundary 
the edge between two of Ornoy regions. So, so you wouldn't connect you know, this point to this point ever. Of course, you wouldn't do that anyway, but if you have a very highly non-uniform grid, it's not so easy to tell. So you just connect the points that have to cross an edge. And that produces something called the Delaunay triangulation. And those are the best triangulations you can get. Be well, in the sense that among all possible triangulations of these points, it has the largest minimum angle in the triangle. You know that. So now we do this for our, our particular Voronoi tessellations, you know, the ones that are very nice. And so that means the Delaunay grid is really nice. It's very, very well behaved. No anomalies, no nothing. In 3D, it's even nicer because it has very, you know, the big problem in 3D grid generation is slivers, very thin elements. And we, we do a very good job at avoiding those. So we can produce, and for many of the applications, we use this for solving PDEs and Navy mm -hmm. Stokes and things like that where you use triangular elements. Mm -hmm. So we use this technology for that. So we generate very good triangular grids. Thanks. Más preguntas? Bueno, si no le vamos a dar las gracias otra vez a Max. Thank you for your talk.